We have a very distinguished speaker at lunch today, and uh, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Angelina Galitova, one of our board members, and Angelina is going to do the uh, regards to do the introduction. So Angelina, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think I got to do this introduction because we spearheaded with the support of the ISO. It wouldn't have been possible without that support, the International Energy Tour, where we have our international experts coming to support the initiative that the ISO had this year for the symposium, which was regional collaboration and being able to advance that regionalism and showcase that this is not an issue that we have here locally and nationally, but that this is indeed an international issue that we're all going to be working on, and that the leaders of the ISOs and the TSOs moving us towards a decarbonized grid and moving us beyond the 50% are going to be the ones drafting the playbook of the future and how do we operate a system that is dependent on renewables. So we've had a wonderful success with the tour, mainly because we had the ISO um, anchor this with the symposium, which is an amazing event, over a thousand people. Tom Dowdy, you deserve incredible credit. Thank you for doing it. Let's hear uh, a round of applause for Tom Dowdy, <laughs> who's taken this event from a small regional meeting, which we had at the basement of a hotel, to, to a large-scale um, event. And we've had now participants from eight countries from Europe coming, six large transmission operators, both national as well as privately owned, and straddling two countries. We've got several NGOs, we've got think tanks, we've got energy regulators, we've got ministry level people, and everyone is watching the ISO. We've truly become a global leader, and we're particularly proud of that. So I do want to recognize the ISO's leadership in making this happen. I also want to thank the organizers of the tour, Renewables 100 um, Policy Institute, and Diane Moss for organizing it, RGI, the Renewables Grid Initiative in Europe with Antonella Battellini, who you'll see tomorrow. She's been amazing. We also had incredible support from within here in California. We had the support of the California Public Utilities Commission, Commissioner Mike Florio and his staff, President Picker. And there's one tidbit. We heard that the CEC had an event of Kevin Barker getting married today, we can beat that. We actually had Commissioner Florio staff person, Michael, uh, Matthew Tisdale, who ended up having a baby 12 days early, <laughs> right when the Europeans arrived. So there must have been excitement in the air at the PUC as well. So we'd like to take credit for that. I'd like to thank Stanford, specifically Diane Grunich and Jimmy Chen for supporting us, the support of the CEC with uh, Chair Weisenmiller and, of course, David Hochschild, who have always supported international initiatives, the governor's office, Cliff Rechtschaffen and Ken Alex, who are speedy, spearheading the under two MOU for the state of California on the way to Paris. Last but not least, their resources board and Mary Nichols, who has been guiding us through this effort, and I'd like to bounce ideas off of her, and I would send her the agenda and the list of participants, and she'd write back. How come there's no gender diversity? All the CEOs are male. <laughs> I wish I could help, but maybe next year we'll have a few transmission operators who are females as well. That would be nice. And all of us together collectively can make that happen. So we'll, we'll be sure to, to keep that pressure moving forward. So in light that this has been an internationally focused symposium and that we wanted to make sure that we invite a really brilliant and dynamic speaker to be our keynote speaker for lunch, for the lunch um, that we are having right now. And of course, we picked Michael Leibrick. He's a well-known speaker on a global scale. He's the founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and we are very happy that he's able to join us here today. Most of you are familiar with BNEF, where Michael chairs the advisory board. This is the world's leading providing research for senior decision makers in the clean energy, carbon, and power markets, as well as advanced transportation, new energy technologies, and natural gas. Their publications are a must read for every energy leader around the globe. 
You've probably read his bio, so I'm not going to bore you with details except with a, per a couple of personal items. Michael organizes an annual summit every year in New York, and it's a huge event with several thousand people, and he leads it, so he has a very busy schedule. But this year, he stepped up, he took time, and he allowed the launch of WISER under his initiative. And WISER is the first organization of women in sustainability, energy, and renewables. So he stood among us, about seven of us, <laughs> and he moderated a panel brilliantly and was very comfortable acknowledging that women do have a role in energy leadership as well. Um, Michael is not involved in a myriad of important initiatives around the world, some of which are he serves on the advisory group for the UN Secretary General's Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. He's on the selection committee for the Zayed Future Energy Prize. Interesting co coincidence, one of our participants here on the energy tour received that prize last year. They don't know each other, so there was nothing going on there, but it was good to know that this is an initiative that recognized a leader like Eike Weber, the head of the Fraunhofer Institute, who received the award last year. He also helps young people succeed in the sustainable energy field through the Economic Forum for Technology Pioneers. Michael holds a degree from the University of Cambridge, as well as an MBA from Harvard. And he is super busy, but there's also an interesting fact about him, that in 1992, while he was working with McKinsey, he took time off from the consulting practice because he was an Olympian. He was on the UK ski team, and he competed for the US yeah, for the UK Olympic team. Hopefully you got the gold, Michael, but just being on the Olympic team is incredible success. So really, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome a good friend, a world-renowned energy expert, and a great humanitarian, Michael Leibrick. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Angelina. Thank you. Um, it's always been embarrassing when I get introduced as the Olympian, uh, the skier, because of course everybody going through everybody's minds, and I, you're all very polite, but I know you're thinking, well, did he win? Um, well, I think there was also a clue there in Angelina's remarks, which is that I was on the British ski team. <laughs> but I was the highest place management consultant. Um, <laughs> This is actually quite an intimidating audience. Uh, I, I, um, I sort of feel like somebody who's, I don't know, uh, the analogy I used, I hope you're not offended, is somebody who's enjoyed eating salami all his life and suddenly discovers a salami factory. Um, because I, as a, I've been a user, obviously, of your services uh, throughout, throughout my life just as a consumer. So it's a, it's a big crowd. And I was trying to think, what is the appropriate collective uh, noun for a, uh, for a gathering of, uh, of ISO leaders. And uh, the best thing I can come up with is a network. So it's a, a, a network as the collective noun. And I think that plays to the theme of your, uh, your gathering here um, because, of course, you're under enormous pressures to deal with transitions in the world and those transitions require you to network more, uh, both physically and also uh, at events like this. So what I thought I could do, perhaps to spur some discussion, is bring a little bit of uh, an international perspective, talk about some of the uh, forces at work, not necessarily forces at work on, on, on ISO, ISOs, but forces at work that are driving the transitions that we see in the energy system. And now, I don't have a monitor here, so I'm going to have to turn around to make sure I'm talking to the right thing. So if it looks a bit stilted, I apologize, but we'll have to see how it goes. So... What we do, we track, among, one of the things we do is we track all the investment activity in clean energy. And of course, the first question is, well, what's clean energy? What you see here in this chart is renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart grid, power storage. It doesn't include natural gas or nuclear, not because we don't like it, just because we wanted to give a clean signal so you could see, is investment going up, down, or sideways? That's really the purpose of this. Um, and you can see over time, since 2004, an enormous surge in the investment activity. Um, those were the go-go years uh, for clean energy, growing very rapidly. You can see the impact of the first uh, crisis, the collapse of Lehman, uh, the growth rate stutters, 
And then you'll all remember green stimulus programs. Every country had to have a green stimulus program. Everything had to be shovel ready, supposedly. Uh, and then the investment continued uh, for another few years. But then it turned down. And we did a lot of work on why did it go down from 2011, 2012, 2013. Was it that the shift to clean energy had stalled? Or was it the dramatic drop in the cost of the equipment? And what we found was it was about two-thirds the cost reduction and about one-third in various countries the progress had come to a halt. So the gigawatts installed was part of it, but it was a minor part. And then 2014, you saw it uh, took off again, uh, an increase in investment activity, um, which was a great relief to those in the sector. And the, just the, the quantum of investment there is about a third of a trillion dollars per year worldwide. Put it in perspective, it's about um, two trillion of some sort of investment in the energy sector, depending how you define it. And so uh, that's uh, 300 billion. And there are figures of around 750 billion to a trillion that's needed if we're going to see emissions peak and turn around from the energy sector uh, in time to, to hit the climate goals that we're told are so vital. So at the beginning of this year, we looked at what do we think is going to happen in 2015. And we actually said we thought it would be down. And we thought it would be down partly because of you know, worries about China, partly because of worries about Europe. The Greek situation looked like it might be uh, uh, heating up again. And also because the dollar is strong. And when you count deals that are not in dollars, and you put them into dollars, you have to do more of them to get to the same number. Now, this is the quarterly track so far this year. And the red line, you can see, is a rolling average. We are tracking last year almost exactly, and in fact, very close to record levels of investment. And it's really important that investment today, every dollar today, buys you a lot more renewable energy than it did five years ago. I'm sure you've all seen the figures. 80%, 85% drop in the cost of solar, cost of wind also uh, coming down very dramatically to uh, competitive levels, as we'll see. If you do a little tour of the world, um, that's the US. Um, I don't think I need to spend much time on uh, explaining the US. Investment is kind of on again, off again, just like the production tax credit for wind. It follows your political cycles. Uh, it's extremely responsive to the stimulus that comes out through uh, Wall Street. And so you can see there, it kind of it bounces around. This is Asia. You know, Asia is an extraordinary story. You know, when I started New Energy Finance back in 2004, Asia, very low levels of investment. And it's really just grown one way since then. And of course, a lot of it was China, first investing very heavily in manufacturing for solar, and also, of course, wind. Wind as a real solution to China's energy needs. Very cheap credit being applied. Uh, and right the way through the crisis, China powered through. But it's not just China. There's Japan post Fukushima. There's India with the Modi government. Uh, there's even smaller countries like Thailand that are very interesting markets for some of our investor clients. And we see investment really across the board. One of the stories of the last decade has been the diversification from sort of Denmark and Germany and then California uh, and out into all of the countries of the world to the point where the developing world now sees more investment in clean energy than the developed world. And then there's Europe. <clears throat> and Europe, when I started, in fact, we can all remember, I would have been standing up here and the question would have been, what can we learn well, the question is always, what can we learn from Europe? But it would really have been, can we copy the massive success of Europe? Because Europe had really, um, was the, it, it had surged ahead, the first region for large-scale investment in renewable energy. Uh, and then you saw the impact there. You can see it, the impact of the uh, financial crisis. It wasn't really the first round. It wasn't 2008, but it was 2011. And it hit Europe very, very hard, particularly southern Europe. Uh, and you've also got encapsulated in there um, issues of saturation or, or uh, maturity, if you like, in Germany. And hidden in this chart also the cost drop, the dramatic cost drop. So although it looks like a terrible story the last few years, 
In fact, the installation rates have been uh, fairly healthy since the peak. One of the countries that's been the strongest country recently in Europe, I'm proud to say, is the UK. Uh, who'd have thought? Um, and, uh, but even that now uh, being questioned, there's a new, uh, a new Tory majority government um, which is questioning some of the support mechanisms that are in place. And that's really at the heart of what's going on in Europe is the question of policy uncertainty. It's our old friend. Um, it started with the retroactive changes to uh, the support mechanisms in Spain in 2008-9, and then it went to Italy. Uh, it's flowed through Europe, but it really still continues because a lot of European countries are now moving to um, reverse auctions. They're trying to bring the price signal back into the system and changing, therefore, their regulatory frameworks. And in some cases, in quite a few cases, with an eye very closely on budgets, they're also saying, we're going to have a budget cap for the support for clean energy. And that creates enormous uncertainty because the price signal is how you allocate capital. The, the budget cap then interferes with or allocates capital in a different way. And so for the investors, it's very unstable, very unsettling, because you don't know if you're going to work on a project, whether you're, going to, what, whether you're going to be under the cap or not under the cap. So a lot of uncertainty uh, in markets in Europe. And the move to um, reverse auctions or price signals is something happening around the world. Now, if I go back to the overall picture, though, which is the, the health of investment, the health certainly in terms of gigawatts, but also in terms of dollars, you know, it's not because of, you know, the Pope has published his encyclical, Laudato Si, and he actually says uh, renewable, you know, that we need more renewable energy. I believe it was written in Latin, and I need to go do the recital. I want to know how you say renewable energy in Latin. Um, but it wasn't, it, you know, that was a very helpful intervention. But people are not shifting to clean energy because of moral pressures or because of the issue of climate change so much as the issue of the economics. Um, what we're seeing now, after this precipitous drop in prices, we're at the point where we now see solar unsubsidized at sub six cents per kilowatt hour, sub $60 per megawatt hour, unsubsidized, and you see wind at Un, sub $40, so $0.04 cents per kilowatt hour. And around the world, you see these prices, not just in one or two projects, you now start to see these uh, prices in more and more projects. It's not general yet for the industry to be at that low cost, but you are absolutely in the zone where renewable energy is fully competitive, can be fully competitive with fossil uh, alternatives. And that has enormous implications. It is this that is driving the continued health of the clean energy sector in the face of quite substantial macroeconomic and, in some cases, political headwinds. However, what we're seeing is it's not just renewable energy that is reducing its costs. When you go around all the other types of energy, we're in a low-cost era. And so that's something that's really important to bear in mind. I think that there's a, um, a, a simple rule of thumb that said, well, we live on a finite planet, stuff depletes, oil and gas, so it must become more expensive over time. What does that mean? That means that clearly everybody will understand the need to, sw to switch to clean energy. That's absolutely clear. If it's not for climate, we're going to have to do it anyway. It also means you don't have to be that efficient in your policy because the consumer will understand that the prices are going up anyway and therefore being forced to do something quite expensive doesn't really matter because people just have to understand energy is going to be expensive. Um, I love this cartoon. It appeared in the um, Economist magazine, <clears throat> but it really encapsulates in the oil markets the fight between Saudi Arabia and the US, the unconventional uh, producers, their fight for market share. And the oil price drop is very eye-catching. Last year, I was asked countless times, 
or I was, in, I was in fact told that the oil price drop will stop investment in renewables, and I had to explain that oil doesn't compete uh, really in the electricity markets and so on. It's really all about gas uh, for the purposes of renewables. And, but in gas markets too, what we've seen in the last year and a half is falling prices internationally and a reduction in the spread. You know, there was an extraordinary period for a few years where natural gas might be $18 per million BTU in Asia and two in the US. And you've all read the stories about the reindustrialization of America because of these huge spreads and so on. That is going away. And it's going away uh, full, permanently. It's not, just, uh, it's not just going away because there's a little bit of a spike downwards in prices, odd conditions in the markets, something that the Saudis are doing. It is structural. And at the heart of it is um, technology. We all know that the rig counts are dropping. I've just pulled out here uh, natural gas. I could talk about oil as well, but I, for this audience, it's, it's gas. Um, the rig counts in the US are dropping, not just because of recent factors. They've been dropping for some time. And in fact, they've, they've dropped by a factor of six since 2007. The rig count is down by a factor of six, extraordinary, since 2007. But here is the output per rig. It's a fake statistic because, of course, it's, it, it includes, you know, this is not the rig, you know, these are the rigs drill and frack and then move on. But this is just taking the aggregate of production divided by the aggregate of rigs to illustrate the point that whilst the rig count has gone down by a factor of six, the output has gone up by a factor of eight. And that's why you've got a lot of gas flooding into the markets and why the prices are still two and three dollars per million BTU and not going up as people thought to five and six and, and, and back up to the more normal prices that, uh, of the past. And they'll never go up uh, again. And obviously around the world, this technology of shale, uh, unconventional gas, this is, those are all rigs, but the technology of unconventional gas is spreading around the world. And it'll do it in two ways, either technology transfer to the shale resources of Mexico, or of China, or of the UK. Very difficult politically, but it's, uh, it's being pushed very hard. And if that doesn't happen, then it'll happen through the LNG markets. There's enormous investment in LNG, whether it is Chenier here in the US, or whether it is the Australians, or whether it is the Iranians coming out of sanctions. So this cheap um, gas is moving around the world. The loser. This is the coal price. And you can see the coal price there has um, uh, been on a decline for quite some time to fairly dramatic effects. Uh, these are major coal companies which have gone bankrupt, gone into Chapter 11 or bankruptcy uh, in the last 18 months. You can see Patriot, Boomi, James River, Walter Energy, and then Alpha Coal. And I like this one particularly because their slogan was, um, what is, I, I've got to see it from here. Um, we fuel progress around the world. And a lot of um, the coal companies have said, well, you know, as the demand drops in the US, and it will start to drop in Europe for all sorts of reasons, um, don't worry, it's a big world. There's either China or there's India. But of course, um, they're not fueling anything around the world anymore. If you had put a dollar into coal at the beginning of 2013, two years ago, it would now be worth 25 cents. Oil, for a while it did well, then the price crashed and you'd have lost a bit. And that is clean energy. That's the NEX index that we publish. Now, before you celebrate too much, or before anybody celebrates, it all underperforms. Energy has underperformed the NASDAQ and the S&P and so on. But it's an illustration that value is being transferred from the high carbon to the low carbon energy technologies. Uh, another way of putting that is that the 25 cents that you've got left in your pocket, having invested a, a dollar, is what I call uh, divestment, but divestment through value destruction. It's nothing to do with Bill McKibben. Um, so looking forwards, we do a huge exercise once a year to uh, model out the future of energy and the energy mix and where the investment is going to go. And what we're looking at around the world in summary is $12 trillion between here and 2040 being spent on the generating capacity 
two thirds of it will be renewable technologies, two thirds of it, despite the cheap gas. And that is because over that period, the experience curve driving down the cost of renewables continues to grind away at the prices. If you don't believe me, that's um, Fatih Birol. He's the chief economist of the IEA, the International Energy, Energy Agency. Uh, and he says the exact same thing, that the dominant role in the developed world and the leading role around the world will be uh, held by renewable energy in terms of the new uh, rollout of capacity. Uh, the G7, um, that was the G7 meeting in Schloss Elmau in Germany. Uh, this understanding that the world is in a transition is now utterly mainstream. This is the leaders of the G7. I speak at, at uh, some schools and I showed this picture and I was waxing lyrical and the children were listening with great, uh, uh, with great attention and one little girl put up her hand and said, well, if that's the G7, why are there nine of them? Uh, yeah, ki kids, eh? Um, <laughs> but it is completely mainstream now, the thinking that we are in a transition uh, and it will have profound implications for what sorts of bilateral and multilateral deals as we approach the Paris uh, discussions are possible. But let's have a look at some of the other implications and implications at the level of uh, the grids and the markets. Um, what you've got there is the proportion of intermittent renewables on the systems around the world. And what you can see You'll be able to read the numbers, I can't, see, can't read them all from here, but what you'll see there is that the intermittent renewables, Germany last year was, um, Germany had 30% of renewable electricity, but about half of that, just under half of that, um, was intermittent. In the UK it was 9%, extraordinarily the UK now has 25% so far this year, renewable electricity, but again, just under half of it intermittent. Canada, uh, California, sorry, 25% um, and so on. So despite the significant, meaningful penetrations, intermittency is not yet a huge problem. This is where we're going. And what you'll see there is figures above 60% for the UK, above 50% for Australia, 25% uh, for the US of intermittent renewables. And this forecast is not based purely on levelized cost. Renewables is cheap, so we'll do lots of renewables. We'll let somebody else deal with the cost of intermittency. This is already assuming that intermittency has a cost and has to be managed. But nevertheless, that's the amount of renewable uh, resource that's being brought onto the grids. Really substantial proportions. We are more bullish than IEA, EIA, BP forecasts, and so on. Um, and we think that this is where we're going. Really very substantial penetrations of intermittent renewables. And that has uh, implications. Um, wind and solar, of course, I think you're probably, uh, almost all of you, grappling with these issues. So I, I don't want to um, teach grandmother to suck eggs or to, to teach your own business, but I'll just show a couple of charts. This one is from Australia so I don't embarrass anybody here in the room. Um, but this is, the top line is Australia's um, GDP, and the bottom line is the demand for electricity on the Australian grid, the majority of the Australian grid, not the little bit in the West. And that, go back to 2010, was the forecast for the volume of demand going forwards. Six months after that was produced, that was the outturn. There's some Deindustrialization, there's some energy efficiency, and there's some rooftop solar. But there's a new forecast. <laughs> Keep calm and carry on. <laughs> and that's the outturn. <laughs> and that's the forecast. Outturn. <laughs> forecast. outturn. <laughs> and I kind of like this one because that was the point at which we started to work with them. Uh, <laughs> so you all laugh. But that's what the future looks like. That's what happens through energy efficiency and distributed resources. And here's the real risk, that if you look at the delta, the figure for 2020, 
that was produced even as recently as 2011, so just four years ago, that's what they thought, and that was the outturn, 25%. There is a risk of massive overinvestment if that's what you think is going to come out, and that's what actually ends up happening. So that's a scary thought. The other thing, and this one is from uh, California, this is the price during the day, because it's not just volume, the time of day matters. So that's the price during, uh, across the day, and there you'll see that's 2013 and 2014 solar output during the day, I think it's a day in April or May. And of course, going forwards, it gets worse and worse. There's more and more, and this is the problem of overproduction during the middle of the day, and that is what it's likely to do to prices. The midday price pushed down by as much as 50% by 2020, and it won't stop there. So that's problem, in a sense, number two. Um, so of course, at this point, you say, well, let's turn back to uh, Laudato C to see if, it's, uh, if, if, the, um, if it contains any other thoughts on energy modeling that will help us get out of this problem. Um, and indeed, the Pope says, we need better uh, technologies of power storage. And again, I'd love to know the Latin for power storage or batteries, but, um, but he says we need, we need the, the technologies are not yet um, adequate. And of course, um, I think you, know, you might want to have checked his remarks with Elon Musk beforehand. Um, but there's a natural jump from intermittency to saying, oh, we need storage. It's just a natural sort of uh, a simple answer and, and everybody can understand it in the mainstream media and uh, politicians and uh, the person on the street can understand storage. Um, but I think we have to be more sophisticated than that. There's a lot of other approaches. Um, we are not anticipating large numbers of people going off grid. So uh, this is um, Ellen Hayes, who's a spokesperson for PG&E. Uh, but she had a lovely way of putting it, which is a solar panel that's not connected to the internet is like, uh, it's, it's not connected to the grid, is like uh, a computer not connected to the internet. We're anticipating storage as the price comes down, driving load defection, maybe very substantial load defection, but still uh, being connected to the grid. And really, it's all about the size of the system you need to go off grid and the huge investment versus relatively modest investments to achieve load uh, defection. So that's what we are uh, we're anticipating there. However, there's a caveat. Uh, and this, Mr. Rubio, I think we all know, he may, I think he may even be in the room. Um, if the response, because what you really need as the consumer is you need a range of services still to manage your system even if you are self-generating, even if you've got power storage, you still need to cover periods when it's maybe not sunny for a few weeks. You'll still need, uh, you may have high demand at times when there's no, no sun during the day. You will also overproduce as the consumer and you need somebody to help you sell your surplus. You need somebody to help you manage your asset. You need somebody uh, to help in the case that you're, of your uh, problem with your inverter, you need a backup. So you still need all these services, you still need that grid connection, and it still needs to be paid for. But it needs to be paid for in a way that doesn't alienate the consumer. In Spain, they've just introduced an approach whereby you pay a fixed amount for the connection that you need to maintain, but also a variable amount for the solar production. And Mr. Rubio's remark here saying what happens Behind the meter is no business of anybody other than the customers. I think it's really important to bear that in mind because if the customer is annoyed by somebody taxing self-production, you don't tax a user for cooking their own food, growing their own tomatoes, etc. Why would you tax them for producing their own electricity? Uh, I think there is a potential for a real consumer uh, backlash that could unite, by the way, both sides of the political spectrum. I want to talk a little bit about electric vehicles because um, you know, they are, it's always nice to show a picture of a, uh, a local product, um, the Tesla. And uh, we're very bullish on electric vehicles, very bullish. I'm also uh, on the board of Transport for London and I see some of the problems uh, around the transportation systems and I'm something of a lone voice being extremely bullish on electrification uh, of, of vehicles. Um, and you can see there, there was the, um, the forecast, uh, I think it's the, in the New York Times, so that we see the prices coming down and down until every family can afford one. 
And uh, that's a very optimistic vision. We share that vision. The only problem with that, it was actually written uh, about one of those um, in, in 1915. Um, and we're still waiting. We are still waiting, but we are optimistic. The experience curve, the volume, Elon Musk's gigafactory, but not just Elon Musk, every manufacturer, whether it's BYD over in China or whether it's Panasonic of Japan, everybody is investing enormously. There is a level of investment in the scale up and also technological development that we've not seen in batteries uh, for, for a, a century or more. So we're optimistic about batteries coming down the experience curve, electric vehicles becoming competitive on a full cost of ownership with internal combustion engines uh, and also offering uh, the fabulous acceleration, etc. And then there's this issue. Uh, that's actually a picture of London. Um, not that you'd know. Um, and the issue of air quality is not just Beijing or Delhi. It's an issue of core importance to public health around the world, around the world. There's almost no cities. I think San Francisco uh, and, uh, and Dublin are the only two that I've visited in the last five years where people haven't immediately said, yes, that's exactly one of our, you know, we are grappling with this becoming more and more important. That's to do with their, their issue, their, their, their clean air is to do with their geographical positioning. Every other city uh, has got a problem. And of course, it's coming to a head. Um, Dieselgate is not about VWs in the US, it's about whether you can drive small uh, internal combustion vehicles in large concentrations in cities at an affordable uh, price point. Uh, the, it, it touches the auto manufacturers, the regulators, and so on. And one of the natural outcomes is going to be acceleration of electrification. Uh, it's just going to be, uh, it's going to be absolutely leading in, in that direction amongst others. Um, just to pull together some of those themes, what we're seeing with this transition, this huge investment in renewable energy, is an incredible fight for the customer, for the consumer. Because I said we're in the age of plenty. There is cheap renewable energy, cheap gas, cheap coal, cheap nuclear, as long as you've already got it, not if you try and build it, as we're finding out with uh, our nuclear power station at... Um, I think it's $40 billion for 3.6 gigawatts. Um, extraordinary prices. But if you've got nuclear, it's, it's cheap at the margin. Um, but how does the customer get the benefit of all that? Cheap, cheap energy efficiency as well. How does the customer get the benefit? Because it's complicated. It's in the wrong place. It's at the wrong time of, uh, of the day. Uh, it disappears when you, just when you need it most. And so providing the customers those services to enable them to enjoy, to use that cheap energy, that's the name of the game. In the energy industry, in the, in the, uh, in the utility industry, the only safe place to be is really close to your customers. So you see utilities get, trying to get very close and often they offer their customers uh, these digitally enabled, enhanced services. You also see startups nimble companies trying to do the same. Some of them created and funded in California, but you see it around the world. And you see big companies, not traditionally energy players, not traditionally in the utility business, entering the market. Why? Because if you're a telecoms company and you see somebody who's doing big data and helping a client to manage a resource, lower their costs, achieve security and reliability, that's a service set that you understand pretty well. And so you see Telefonica, you see AT&T, you see NTT in, in Japan, uh, and so on, entering the market and offering services. And companies like ADT. ADT is very well respected and very trusted by consumers. Can they manage your energy demands? Why not? Since it's not about generating the kilowatt hours, it's about managing it, helping the customer, why not? We also see corporates by building their own. Uh, it started with some financial service players that said, oh, we'll go carbon neutral. That's not that difficult if you're a bank. It's not like you're smelting aluminium, so it's, you, know, you, you can probably have a, have, a, have a decent go at it. But we also saw it then went into the media players. They have server centers. It's more difficult. Then you see retailers. You've got premises. You've got refrigeration. It's more difficult. Again, higher energy demand. Manufacturers. And now 
even extractive, uh, um, extractive industries and primary industries, Dow Chemical, investing in renewable energy because it's cheap. They are doing it themselves, and they need a range of services to help them manage that. It's a completely different uh, game to simply being the utility that sells them the electricity uh, and then a bill once a year and make sure that there's never a blackout. This is a very different game, helping uh, these companies to manage their portfolio of energy requirements. Now, all of that's incredibly exciting. It's a time of dramatic change. It's already go sweeping through electricity, and it's uh, going to go through transportation. Here's the sad thing, though. Even with all of that, because of the huge legacy investments that have already been made, and to a certain extent, the investments in the developing world in the next few years until renewables really gets down to the low costs, we will still, in 2040, be generating 44% of our power from fossil fuels. So as the world's leaders go into Paris, that is the context. Despite vast change and can-do attitude, this incredible network of, of leaders in your industry and others, we are still not going to achieve on these trajectories the carbon budget associated with two degrees. So more is needed. And then, if I could just wrap up, Angelina asked me to leave you with a few thoughts, a few conversation starters, maybe, uh, and I'll try to do that. And because I can't really see over there, I've got them on a, on, on a bit of paper here as well, so I, I don't have to crane over and read them. And the first thing is, price signals are probably the worst way of allocating capital in the power system, other than every other way that's ever been tried. So it's really important that our regulators and our politicians don't try to essentially nationalize electricity by the back door because of these trends. In, intermittency is a problem. Nobody is trying to hide it. Maybe some activists, but not any serious people. But when you get really cheap renewable energy, one way of thinking about it is it frees up a budget to manage intermittency. When you buy solar at six cents, and then it's going to be at five, and it's going to be at four, and it's going to be at three, and that's cheaper than anything else, that is your budget to manage your intermittency. But there's got to be a merit order to do that. I said it can't just be uh, about batteries. So the merit order, efficiency, reduce the scale of the problem. Demand management. Demand management, uh, uh, well, for, um, First, then I think the, the next one there is weather forecasting, but demand management as well. These are software approaches. Software, bits, is always going to be cheaper than kit. Pervasive sensors mean that we'll be able to control everything. The proportion of our electricity demand that yields, or that is managed, that uh, yields to demand management approaches is going to increase dramatically. The US is a world leader but you have only just started. If you really look at the final demand for electricity, I'm guessing 80 or 90% of it by 2040 could be in some way in demand management markets. Maybe only a few tenths of a second, maybe longer. The purpose of this meeting, the network, interconnections, if you want to do this transition at a low cost, do it with your neighbors. Another way I use to describe this is treat your neighbors, your neighboring ISOs nicely because you never know when you'll want to use them as a battery. <laughs> Only then, in the merit order, will you want to invest in real batteries. That's why I, give, I, I urge caution about saying intermittency equals batteries because those other ways are going to be cheaper. And then the final way to deal with intermittency, of course, is backup, and that's going to be the most expensive. My third thought is storage, not about batteries. It's also not just about electricity. If intermittency is the core issue that we're going to be dealing with for the next few decades, we have to be creative. Think about thermal storage. Think about desalination. Think about vehicles. 
All of those play into storage. It's not just about batteries. Number four, new entrants. Incumbents tend not to cannibalize their own industries. Funny that. And so as you implement regulations, as our politicians drive through change, one of the acid tests should always be, does it encourage new entrants, new technologies, new business models, or does it discourage them? And I think in particular, an example is capacity markets. If you do capacity market wrong, it is a machine for suppressing innovation. And then finally, point number five, for consumers, now we're all deeply educated about all these issues. We tend to make economic decisions, but consumers don't. For consumers, energy is deeply woven into their lives. It's much more than just the numbers. And so if we get these transitions wrong, we'll get unpredictable behavior. We'll get people defecting from the grid on principle, or you'll get issues around geopolitics and the urge to be energy uh, independent, trumping what would otherwise be rational behavior. And so those are my final closing thoughts for you. Thank you very much. A great honor to have uh, such a wonderful audience. And I'll hand back now to Steve, I believe, if I can, if I can see where. Ah, oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs>